Hello, and welcome to Game Media Industries. This subject is designed for students studying media and communication at the University of Wollongong, and it investigates the emergence of game media industries as a key element of the global creative economy. In this subject, we analyse games from the perspectives of players, developers, studios and publishers, situating them within a continuum of human play activities and media entertainment industries. Previous knowledge about games is not required at all for this subject, and it will provide an inclusive learning environment for students whose knowledge of the game industry is peripheral and less participatory. Students undertaking this subject will examine a range of potential topics, including the trajectory of game design from its earliest form of, el of electronic and digital games to contemporary experiences such as mobile apps, esports, board games, and live streaming. Students are going to acquire practical skills in game media production by working individually and collaboratively on digital artifacts specific to the game industries. The core learning assessment strategy for this subject is the digital artifact, which is a self-directed project of research and practical experimentation in multiple media and communication technologies. The digital artifact for this subject will be focused on producing an analysis of game media texts or paratexts using an appropriate analytical framework built from concepts and ideas drawn from the subject lectures and readings. To get a sense of how other students have approached this task, you can visit the subject blog where you will be sharing your own work. I'll put the link in the description below, but you can also just go straight to gamecultures.blog. So let's have a look at the, um, the, the learning outcomes uh, for the subject. On successful completion uh, of the subject, you will be able to engage in research to critically analyze game media texts and discuss implications and issues within the global game industries. You'll be able to present uh, a critical analysis of a digital game or game media practice, and you'll be able to demonstrate digital literacies in the preparation and delivery of a public digital artifact addressing a topic relevant to the games industries. So what is game media? A more traditional approach to game studies might begin with a definition of what games are. This typically involves a series of logical steps detailing what counts as a game and what doesn't, but that is not what this subject is about. We are not only interested in games as objects, but also the ecosystem or media ecology, which exists because of games. And so our focus for the subject is the broader topic of game media. We will be discussing specific games and their design principles, but this will be framed within broader thinking of um, theories and ideas about audiences, about communities related to games, about topical issues like the intellectual property involved in games and game texts. We'll be thinking about the way in which games and game media represent, and we'll be talking about uh, games in terms of their contribution to knowledge production, and so on. The important thing to think is that Game media is an umbrella term. It's a really encompassing um, description of diverse and multiple elements that are part of the games industry's current global success. So when we talk about game media, we're talking about the hardware layer. We're talking about the, the physical and the material components of playing video games and computer games and board games. So we're talking about um, the material objects. We're talking about the consoles, the computers, the controllers, the chips, the mobile phones, even the internet servers and the cloud storage that enables digital distribution and social interaction through multiplayer online. When we talk about game media, we're also talking about the software layer. So we're talking about the apps, the code, the platforms, and the programs which operate to provide players with game experiences. 
So, obviously then, game media also refers to the content layer. The games themselves, the presence of visual and sound design, the character and level design, as well as, of course, the embedded narrative and world building that shapes and enhances the player's experience. Game media also involves a promotional layer, uh, which encircles the hardware and the software layers. It encircles and is kind of part of the content layer. And this includes everything from advertising, merchandising, marketing, journalism, criticism and review which all support the consumer's experience and their understanding and awareness of the current state of the industry and its products. This brings us to another important layer, which of course is the cultural layer. This is the production of blogs, wikis, online videos, uh, Facebook groups, podcasts, YouTube videos, Twitch streams, and of course the massive amount of social media discussion that happens on Discord servers, uh, on Steam uh, reviews, um, and, and this is part of what we will talk in depth in this subject um, of the, the part of the, the participatory media and the participatory culture that is part of the contemporary experience of games that everyone, even casual players, experience by um, playing games in, in, at any level. So one of the primary goals uh, of the subject is to teach you how to research and analyze games media with specific attention to the industrial modes of production, distribution, and reception and to recognize that these are not discrete, but overlapping categories. The industry, uh, of uh, particularly the games media industry, does not simply refer to the manufacture of hardware or the production of games. When we talk about the games media industry, what we're actually referring to is a creative industry. I'm going to unpack what that term creative industry means in a second. But first, I think it's important that we dig into the idea of what an industry is and, and where, does that, um, where does that history come to us from. So you've probably heard of the, the notion of um, Fordism. So the word industry is typically associated with mass production, mass labor, and the principles of Fordism. Henry Ford was an American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company, one of hundreds of small automotive producers operating at the start of the 20th century. Ford did not invent or create the production line. Rather, he saw its potential and he used it to transform the automobile, the car, from a rare luxury good into a mass-produced commodity. He made the car reasonably, at least much more than it was, affordable. He turned the automobile into the car, a personal transport convenience which fundamentally changed the world. Other industries existed, of course, prior to this innovation because the core production of goods and services was fundamental to the organizing principles of society that emerged out of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. It was Fordism, however, these principles of mass production that epitomized uh, manufacturing by standardizing parts, by decreasing assembly costs, and reducing the role of individuals and experts in the production of goods. Uh, a factory line meant that you could replace individual workers and you wouldn't lose the knowledge invested in those workers. You know, of course, this is a, this is a very dehumanizing um, uh, and despecializing um, uh, phenomena, but it's an important one to, to recognize that is at the center of, of what we think of as, as being industry. So manufacturing became the most important industry in the, in the globe um, in the 20th century building on the coal, the steel, and the agricultural industries, and having this major effect of reducing the costs of consumer goods. The affordability of cheaply produced goods became synonymous with lower wages, but also a linear production chain. 
The creative industries uh, is an important term because this system of mass production and standardization was adopted universally. It was applied to publishing. It was applied to music and television and film and radio and marketing and advertising and sports and the performing arts and other cultural works that contribute to the economy. Together, this um, combination of creativity and industrial production became known as the creative industries. The creative industries now include a really broad range of activities which contribute to local, national and global economic progress through the commercialization of knowledge, information and obviously expression or creativity. In his book, The Rise of the Creative Class and How It's Transforming Work, Leisure and Everyday Life, Richard Florida in 2002 observed that the creative industries have become part of the process of shifting from material production to knowledge production. This, of course, was made, made possible by the information era, particularly the, the post-1995 uh, internet era. And Florida argued that because of these technological breakthroughs, human creativity really became the ultimate economic resource. And it became clear over the past two decades that creativity, innovation, knowledge, and imagination are going to be the major contributors to the global economy of the 21st century and beyond. There's an interesting definition um, of the creative industries provided by the Queensland University of Technology, QUT. And um, they describe the creative industries as innovation-led, knowledge-intensive, and highly exportable. This is, this is a, a really interesting um, kind of definition or, or set of concepts that belong to how you might understand the, the creative industries and, and whether you're thinking, okay, what, what's in a, what is a creative industry and what isn't? A creative industry demonstrates um, uh, these elements. Um, QUT also argues that the, the creative industries contribute to cultural diversity, social inclusion, environmental sustainability and technological advancements. And so you can see some of the, the, the underlying politics involved um, in this term, which are also quite interesting. So let's, let's um, narrow our focus now and start to think about games as a global industry. And I'm not going to just talk about games because I think it's important to talk rather about games media. So we're not just talking about the individual game itself, but we're talking about the enormous um, industry, the game media industry that fits under that umbrella that we were talking about before. So games media is one of the largest contributors to the, the creative industries globally. There are major national centers of production, of course, in America, in Japan, Korea, China, UK, and across Europe, but also in smaller countries like Australia and New Zealand. We do um, you know, a reasonably uh, big trade in um, game media production. This means that game media has been a major driver of globalization, not in just... Uh, hardware terms, right, because, you know, most of our hardware is produced in China and Korea and distributed around the world, but in terms of what we might think of as intercultural flow between the West and the East, particularly between Japan and the US from the 1990s, uh, sorry, 1980s onward. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in lectures um, uh, in the future. The global games media industry is an enormous power engine of capitalism, with China rapidly becoming the most profitable market, specifically in the mobile sector. Here, uh, we can see, you know, kind of comparison to uh, the, the movie industry, which is probably the other large historical cultural media industry um, that's useful to, to compare games against. So Variety.com reports um, in 2018 a record-breaking year for box office revenues in the movie industry with $41 US billion 
uh, in global ticket sales. Now, that's just ticket sales alone. According, so that's that's not you know taking into account um, you know DVD uh, streaming services. And that's just that's just pure ticket. So, but let's put that in comparison to the Ibis World figures from the. Uh, the global movie industry, home entertainment revenue. So all of this, all of um, the kind of ways to consume home entertainment. So that's that's including, uh, you know, crossover into Netflix and um, television and things like that, cable. In its entirety, the global movie industry home entertainment revenue, according to uh, Ibis World, uh, in 2018, was approximately 136 US billion. And I'm not sure exactly how reliable these figures are, but it gives us a good kind of marker to think about contextually. Comparatively, the games industry biz uh, study they put the games industry worth 135 US billion. Um, in 2018, with with revenues growing by over 10%. Uh, the mobile games industry, it, just the mobile sale, so, so you're looking at mobile apps, you're looking at microtransactions in, in mobile apps, that kind of thing. Games industry biz are putting the mobile games industry revenue at about $63 billion. So that's almost half of the the total profit from the the games industry just in mobile games uh if we if we dig into the figures mobile games account for the bulk of the industry's revenue 47 percent worth 63 billion and and that's that was up 12.8 percent year on year so these figures will be much higher this year and, and probably much higher at the, at the time you're listening Smartphones, of course, are leading the way with revenues of up to fifty billion, uh, while tablets, interestingly, account for uh, eleven point four billion. Now, these are global figures, um, estimates l- r- largely uh, in U.S. dollars. So, I think that tablet figure is, is very cool because, I mean, that's really pointing to a, a, um, a sector of the audience for games that aren't even you know accessing it on their mobile phones. I'm talking about children here, I think. Tablet games account for 10% of the overall market, meaning that one out of every $10 spent on games is spent on tablets, which is pretty amazing. For those of you that are gamers, um, you'll probably, when we talk about games, think about um, consoles and PCs as being... The, the, the kind of top end consumer point of games. And these figures show that's just not true. Um, mobile, mobile gaming clearly dominates. But the, the um, console industry has been growing. In, in 2018, it increased 15.2%. And its annual profit um, is, is somewhere around 38 to 40 US billion per year, possibly even higher now. The PC games market, uh, this involves both desktop and laptop devices. This uh, this accounts for around 25%, so one quarter of the global games market. That's that's pretty important. One uh, in every four dollars spent on video games is for is is spent for the PC. Now this also includes um, download games, um, box games, but also browser games, and that's that's still a thing. Facebook games is still um, a major uh, contributor to the industry, uh, and you know we we know from from studies that it's it's largely women playing games on Facebook and largely um, uh, middle to, to to late age women. Revenues are also up uh, for the PC games industries, and and they have they have been growing for the better part of the decade. Games revenue, particularly in the mobile sector, is not just pure sales of games, but includes a huge amount of virtual commodities, power ups, unlocks, extra content, weapon and character skins. These are just some of the massive market of virtual commodities that are part of the the creative components uh, of the games industry. These are often called microtransactions, and, and I really think that's a bad term. 
We should just be thinking about them in terms of transactions. These are purchases. They are objects being purchased, and um, they're not micro, right? They're massive. The, the numbers here are enormous. And I don't I, whether it, whether it costs twenty five cents for a for a, a loot crate or, or a dollar for a skin or ten dollars for a DLC pack or whatever. Th- these these are not micro transactions. These are sales. They're also hugely important to the games industry and its investors and attention and scrutiny to them have increased recently as governments and public institutions begin to really take the the, the games media industry seriously and start to regulate it as they have regulated other types of um, entertainment creative industries. Historically, it's important to to think about games and, and where they sit in relation to other media. The dominant media of the 19th century was clearly the novel, uh, the written word. The dominant media of the 20th century was clearly started out as film and probably ended up, or was probably started out as radio, to be honest, and then and then and then film um, and television. And television is 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 still up there, but I think um, you know, predicting ahead, the dominant media of the 21st century. Um, is is going to be video games, and I'm and I'm taking uh, this kind of observation from uh, Dyson and 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 uh, Saucier's uh, history of video games in sixty four objects, which is a, a great book. So let's think about um, how games get made for a minute, and the and the kind of operation of the industry and how it's transformed uh, over the last two decades. We're going to look at the historical development of the studio system over the next couple of lectures, and we're going to look at how the industry has, has developed and, um, you know, in the, from the, the 60s and 70s, the 80s, 90s, early thousands, 2000s. So this is just a really quick, brief overview to situate you in thinking about the industry going forward. Video games um, inherited the studio production system from radio, film, and television. And this means that um, at, the, at the start of this um, linear production model, you get developers working in a studio. So video game development just basically has been dominated by the studio system, it replicated the, the film, television, publication system. This is the same as software creation and many other creative industries are kind of caught in, in, this, in this model. And, it's, and it's, it's thought of as a linear industrial production model, moving from creators at one end to consumers at the other. And of course, if you know anything about the internet, you know that this linear model has been totally disrupted by the rise of consumer power and the and the, the the changes that the internet has brought, but still we've got, we've got this legacy system that we're dealing with, and 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 part of that system is of course publishers. Many studios are actually owned by video game publishers, like um, Electronic Arts um, or Activision Blizzard, and many public uh, many studios um, developers have specific relationships with publishers who fund the development process. This, of course, is complicated by hardware manufacturers. So some hardware manufacturers also operate like publishers and developers or have publishing companies or publishing arms and in-house development studios. I'm thinking particularly here at Nintendo, but, but there are different iterations with regards to, to Sony and Microsoft. That then brings us to the distributors. And for the most part of the history of video games, um, distribution was physical. This meant that um, publishers have complicated relationships with distributors and retail outlets, what we might call the bricks and mortar stores. For example, in the US, the retail chain Walmart has enormous power in the video games market because they can control what is sold on their shelves across that country. The biggest change for the industry 
uh, in the last two decades has been the rise of digital distribution. So the elimination of the physical component of the sales of video games. Some companies still retain this. I mean, it's interesting to see even with the latest generation of Nintendo uh, and the Nintendo Switch, you're still working on a cartridge system. And of course, that's that's clearly you know designed to try and combat um, intellectual property theft and, and piracy. But at the same time, the availability of uh, affordable digital downloads has reduced piracy in the video games industry. It hasn't eliminated it, but it's definitely reduced it because it's made games more accessible and more affordable. And of course, mobile app stores, right, which are basically you know digital game stores. Um, but we're still in this hybrid situation. We haven't eliminated bricks and mortar uh, entirely. This brings us, of course, to the role of advertisers and marketing. You cannot underestimate just how much money is spent on advertising and marketing in the video game industry. It's an important and it's a powerful creative industry in itself, but also in the way that it contributes to how non-gamers and casual players come to an understanding of, of game media. I noticed it a few years back, but... it. it it was in, I was in Melbourne at the time and I was just taken by the number of, you know, large uh, AAA titles, which are the kind of the big games, um, and their advertising on buses, you know, and billboards. There was definitely a, few cha- a change a few years ago where we saw an, a massive uh, increase in the spending on physical media for game advertising. Then at the end of this historical linear production model are players. And players are often underestimated in this system. You know, I'll talk in the future about how digital distribution has changed this. And once um, players were simply thought of as the endpoint, the consumer. And all that mattered was the number of consumers. And so players themselves and players' investment and player communities were often disregarded. But digital distribution, particularly Steam, changed that dramatically. That also had flow-on effects because players began to create content on YouTube, uh, on Twitch, uh, on Facebook, blogs, podcasts, you name it, right? There is an enormous degree of player communities who produce content. Now that feeds back into the system as promotional material. Similarly, we have um, the rise of independent game designers who are empowered by players, um, whether it's through Kickstarter or the Greenlight system when it's on Steam when it first emerged. But we get you know, what's called independent game designers who are not funded by the publishers, but instead funded directly by the players themselves. This creates a huge amount of non-linearity in the system. The internet shifted the, the conditions of this global creative industry, introducing non-linearity and direct audience feedback into the production chain. Steam meant that you could start publishing games before they were finished and you could get feedback from your players. Right? That, 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 that is just in, an incredible development. So that totally changes the notion of what a product in this game media industry even is. Industries, uh, sorry, uh, indies and developers can then also bypass publishers and bypass the physical stores and and publish their games and distribute their games via Steam. And we're we're increasingly seeing diversity in the marketplace with uh, other online stores like the Epic Store, uh, UPlay. There's a whole range of them, and so this has a a, a massive shift again on this. Um, uh, this industry. Now, because we see indies and we see um, independent developers working with players, players and their involvement in the promotional material and the cultural production then start to be able to direct attention towards developers who are working within the traditional studio system. We see, you know, you're able to cho- uh, to tweet directly or contact on Facebook or, um, you know, 
organize uh, petitions and provide feedback via Reddit and things like that that plug directly into the main um, production chain. Uh, similarly, we are you know seeing players having uh, organi- organized um, feedback to publishers. Right, one of the one of the main things that we've seen recently in recent years is is players pushing back against companies like EA and pushing back against predatory consumer practices. So that's that's a that's a really big summary of of kind of the the major changes that the industry has has gone through, you know, over the past forty years. And we're going to break that down much further uh, over the course of the subject and, and talk about it in more detail. Thanks for playing.